thank you very much, Don, and thank you, James, earlier for your introductions. Very generous indeed. Um, I'm thrilled to be in Santa Fe and, and extremely excited and honored to be a guest of both these institutions that have shed so much light together on the evolution of the human condition. Both of these institutions are the preeminent, really, institutions, uh, private institutions, dedicated to shedding light on human history in the broadest sense. And they are to be treasured, and I'm particularly fond of the Leakey Foundation as it approaches its 40th year of munificence, having distributed tremendous amounts of money to young scholars as well as some old established scholars who are interested in studying human origins and all aspects of, of human uh, behavioral precursors and fossil evidence in the entire context of human evolution. So you're very lucky to be uh, sort of uh, sitting and fermenting in the midst of, of the atmosphere created by these institutions. I'm very happy to talk to you tonight about a topic that many of us think about, but not so much in an evolutionary context. I would guess that tonight, as you were walking into the theater, you probably had a good look at lots of the people walking next to you or sitting next to you, and you were very interested in what they looked like. And one of the things that you used to assess them was their skin. Did their skin look old? What color was their skin? Uh, did their skin have any particular marks on it? Uh, anthropologists haven't studied skin very much because it's very hard to study. You don't have fossilized skin to look at in the fossil record, and so people tend to shy away from things that don't have direct physical evidence. What I'd like to introduce you to, to tonight is a line of research that I and some colleagues of mine have been working on for the last 15 years that has helped to shed light on some of the, the evolution of human skin using non-physical evidence in many cases, inferential molecular evidence, uh, all sorts of things that anthropologists don't necessarily resort to. So I hope you'll enjoy this little excursion and that you'll think more about skin by the end of the evening. Now, as I said, you all sized each other up and you looked at each other very closely, I'm sure at least some of you did, to see you know, all the different kinds of skin and skin markings and skin colors that we find around us. And so I really want to try to shed light on that diversity tonight. And I'm going to start out by, by trying to explain to you how can we can reconstruct the history of human skin without a fossil record, and then talk particularly about the evolution of human skin color, which is, I think, really the topic of the day, quite coincidentally, uh, in the world of politics, but also something that we need to think about in the context of our normal social interactions with our fellow humans. Skin color is not something just of anthropological interest, it's of tremendous social import and day-to-day -day import. So, when we look at our, at our uh, closest relatives, okay, this is, this is all of the, of the so-called higher primates of the old world, and this is a family tree or a cladogram, and we're closely related to chimpanzees, and then more closely related to gorillas and orangutans and other old world higher primates. And what we have to do when we think about the evolution of human skin and skin color is try to think about what happened after the last common ancestor of these two lineages. In other words, what happened on this road to humanity? What did our skin look like? And how can we establish what our skin looked like? Well, one of the really interesting things we can do is just by comparative anatomy and physiology is look at the skin and the hair of all these animals. And surprisingly enough, even the darkest of these animals is very light when you go beneath the hair. And so animals that we think of as being very dark animals are actually very light-skinned and they're covered with dark hair. 
And they look, uh, this, this little chimpanzee is a very good example. Very, very light hair, uh, very light skin rather, covered with dark hair. This is something that we don't really think about because often during the course of the animal's life, they will be exposed to the sun and they'll develop more melanin pigment in their skin. Now these animals probably represent something very close to what the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans looked like. And the fact that this condition, light skin covered by dark hair, is shared by all of our closest relatives, leads us to believe that our common ancestor had this configuration and that very early members of our own human lineage did as well. So when we think about how can we reconstruct the configuration in the very earliest members of the human lineage, it th thus becomes a logical deduction rather than a leap of faith. And we can think about early members of our lineage, such as this reconstruction of Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy's species. This, this species probably looked quite chimpanzee-like with respect to its skin. These animals were of short stature and they had rather ape-like lifestyles. They weren't tall striding bipeds like subsequent members of our lineage. They had a much more ape-like way of, of going about things and foraging and resting and so forth. And so almost certainly their skin would have looked quite similar. And so this is how we've reconstructed it. And this is, I think, a quite an interesting and sobering view of our earliest ancestors. But of course, when we look at the totality of the human lineage, we have early members of our lineage that looked like Lucy. They were small, sort of uh, bipedal apes that had relatively small cranial capacities and probably uh, acted in fairly ape-like ways. But when we get later on, closer to the present day, around two million years ago, we begin to see the emergence in the African fossil record of representatives of early members of the genus Homo. Many of the remains are found in Kenya, others in Tanzania and Ethiopia. And one of the most complete is shown here about 1.5 to 1.6 million years ago. These animals, and I would call them actually these humans look very different from their Australopithecine predecessors in that they have modern body proportions. This young man, as he was, would have grown up to be well over six feet tall, as it was he died when he was probably about nine or ten years old and didn't, didn't achieve full skeletal maturity. But had he, he would have been about six feet tall and as strong and strapping a young man as one could imagine. These people that lived in eastern and equatorial Africa about a million and a half year, million years ago were very different from apes in the way that they went about their business. They were active, striding bipeds. Everything about their skeleton, and many studies founded, funded by the Leakey Foundation, have shown that the skeleton of this individual betrays a very, very active lifestyle. These animals were not ape-like in their normal day-to-day -day activities. They didn't just forage for short periods of time. They walked, they ran, they were highly active. Now, what happens if you're a hairy ape-like creature and you're very, very active in a hot equatorial environment? All of a sudden, you have a real physiological crisis on your hands because it's not good to have a blanket on your own body, okay? There is a, a very strong circumstantial case that can be made just on the basis of the fossil evidence and the reconstruction of the activity levels in this human that in fact humans at this stage of evolution would have had to have lost most of their body hair and at the same time would have had to have increased competence as sweaters. One of the things that modern humans do and their immediate predecessors do or did is sweat. We're really, really good at it. And all of our primate relatives are really, really good at it. 
Animals that live in hot environments especially have different mechanisms of keeping cool. Hooved animals, carnivores, they all do different things. Your dog pants. Your cat uses different mechanisms of keeping cool, including uh, keeping cool through its, through its nose and, and having special circulation around its brain to keep cool. Primates keep cool through whole body sweating, which then cools the underlying blood vessels through evaporation and allows cooled blood to circulate around the brain. It's at this stage in human evolution that we can infer from comparative evidence that we became functionally naked and very, very good sweaters. And it just so happens that there's excellent molecular evidence that now backs up this inferential story. Uh, done by Alan Rogers at the University of Utah several years ago, a very, very important study on the evolution of human uh, pigmentation and showing that, in fact, at the same time in human evolution, about a million and a half years ago, we gained the ability to sweat copiously, we lost most of our functional body hair, and we became mostly very darkly pigmented because naked skin is vulnerable skin, and naked skin has to be darkly pigmented in a very, very sunny environment. So why do we need to be such good sweaters? Well, one of the liabilities of having a big brain is that you have to keep it cool. Brains of all size are very heat sensitive, and the larger the brain, the more of a cooling problem that you have. Brains in primates are kept cool by having slightly cooler br uh, blood, oxygenated blood from the heart, pump around the brain to keep it cool. And so it's very, very important that blood that is circulating around the body have a chance to become cool from the surface cooling of radiative and evaporative heat loss. We lose body heat through a variety of ways. Right now, you're losing body heat into the atmosphere. Some of it you're losing into the ground. Some of it you're losing into the seat. If we were to raise the temperature in this theater by about 10 or 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you would start losing more heat to the environment. You might even start breaking out in a sweat. And if I got you to sort of all start exercising simultaneously and do jumping jacks or something like that, and it was 15 degrees hotter, you would sweat copiously. Because the hotter the environment gets, and the more exercise that you undertake, the more heat that you generate in your own body, the more sweating becomes important for you. And so in the history of human skin, we became functionally naked and we became very, very good sweaters. But naked, pale skin is extremely vulnerable to damage from the sun's rays, and especially from ultraviolet radiation. And so, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we now have very good evidence that at the same time, as we became functionally hairless and very, very competent sweaters, we also developed full body dark pigmentation. And the pigment responsible for this is melanin. Melanin is an incredibly interesting chemical. It's actually a family of chemicals. It's produced in cells called melanocytes that reside in the skin here, right at the sort of the junction between the superficial epidermis and the dermis. And melanin that is produced in these melanocytes sits in various vesicles and it does an amazing array of things. It main, it's, its main function, it imparts color, that's what we see. But from a chemical and physical point of view, it does a wide variety of extremely important things. Melanin is a natural sunscreen, and the, the whole family of melanin compounds occur widely in nature. We find varieties of melanins in all vertebrate animals, or virtually all vertebrate animals, in many invertebrates. We find forms of melanin in fungi. Melanins 
are used almost ubiquitously in, in nature. And for the good reason that when evolution comes up with a good chemical solution to a problem, it doesn't abandon it. It uses it over and over and over again. It'll simply tweak it a little bit, change it a little bit, but don't change the whole thing because it works. And so melanins are, occur widely. They've evolved widely in modified forms. A form called eumelanin is the part, is the type that imparts most of the color to human skin. And in its isolated form, it's this really dark, sludgy stuff. It's, if you got it in the bottom of a beaker, you'd think it was like, oh, this, this sort of very dark, almost black mucilage. But in fact, it's a very, very complex polymer, very hard to ca characterize chemically, but fascinating because it, it absorbs and scatters ultraviolet radiation, which is a very interesting physical property of the molecule, and it chemically neutralizes very, very damaging chemicals in the body. These things called reactive oxygen species that many people call free radicals. These free radicals can cause an enormous amount of damage in your body. They can damage DNA, directly, they can damage other components in the cell. Basically, they can wreak havoc on the internal machinery of your cells. And so the fact that melanin can do all of these interesting things by residing in the skin and simply absorbing and chemically neutralizing these negative compounds is really quite remarkable. And so, of course, the deduction that is unavoidable is that the early members of our lineage, the earliest members of the genus Homo, these highly active bipedal primates living in equatorial Africa about beginning around a million and a half years ago, were functionally naked, they were very competent sweaters, and they had darkly pigmented skin. All of us owe our ancestry to this, uh, this, this appearance, this highly adapted appearance that allowed us to be highly active with big brains in a very, very hot environment. But when we look around us, and we, when you took stock of all the people coming in the door tonight, you saw people with at least a moderate range of skin color. And we know that within modern humans today, we find people who have everything from the very palest to the very darkest skin. And so, having at least established that, that a very dark pigmentation was our resting state for early members of the genus Homo, our ancestral state, what happened in subsequent as in periods in human evolution when humans left equatorial Africa? Before I do that, however, I want to try to establish why dark pigmentation is so highly conducive in very sunny environments because it does a lot more than just scatter UV and prevent some chemical damage. It prevents some other types of chemical damage that are particularly important or the particularly relevant to human reproductive success. Our thesis in, in studying the evolution of, of, of human skin color has been a very simple one, that melanin pigmentation levels have evolved as an evolutionary compromise between the rates of breakdown of certain UV-sensitive compounds and the rates of production of certain UV-dependent compounds. In other words, you've got an, just enough melanin in your skin to protect you from the most harmful UV rays that are going to cause a lot of cellular damage and disrupt, in some extreme cases, reproductive success. And yet, you'll have just enough so that you can continue to make some particularly important UV-dependent compounds in your skin. In other words, you've got just enough melanin in your skin to balance these conflicting physiological demands. Now, UV radiation is a fascinating uh, aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. We, of course, are obsessed with the visible spectrum. The infrared spectrum is very important for us in communications and in some, some organisms' visibility. 
But here we are in the UV range. And UV, of course, these various species have different properties. I'm not going to go into it. Most of the properties of ultraviolet radiation or most of the things that it does to biological systems are harmful. But it's important to say that in the early days of evolution on the Earth's surface, ultraviolet radiation was probably one of the most important creative forces behind the evolution of biotic systems. In the days before Earth had much of an atmosphere, we got the sun's rays beating down on us more or less unimpeded, and life forms, the very earliest life forms, had to evolve all sorts of, of clever chemical ways to protect themselves against high levels of UVR and other uh, ionizing radiation. So really, although we malign most of the effects of UVR, it has been one of the most important influences on human and other forms and other biotic forms of evolution uh, in, in the history of the world. UV is basically, however, malign as far as we're concerned. It damages DNA directly as well as indirectly by producing molecules that can damage DNA. It can, it, uh, UVR produces free radical species that damage DNA. UV damages cell membranes and causes lots of disruption in the, in the very casement of cells. And it breaks down some vitamins. And I'm going to dilate on this point more in just a few minutes. The only unequivocally good thing that ultraviolet radiation does for most vertebrates is that it catalyzes or begins the process of catalyzing vitamin D production in the skin. And it does this if you're a frog, it does this if you're a lizard, it does it if you're a mammal or a human. It does this in all vertebrates. It's extremely important. Vitamin D, as we'll, as we'll return to in just a few minutes, is absolutely essential to the human physiological economy because without vitamin D, we can't absorb calcium that we take in through various dietary sources. Now, these different types of UV, these different wavelengths, penetrate the skin to different levels. UVC, which is the very shortest, hardly ever actually impinges on biological systems, except in the areas where we have an ozone hole over the Arctic and especially over the Antarctic. So we don't generally have to worry about UVC. But UVB and UVA are big players. Uh, and we think about this all the time. Your dermatologist or your doctor might talk to you about these different species. UVB is a particularly energetic form of UV. It's not present at high concentrations, but it's quite lethal. It penetrates the skin to a short distance. It can do all sorts of damage to DNA. It can do all sorts of damage to other components of the skin. The one good thing it does is it initiates the process of making vitamin D in the skin. UVA is a, short, a longer wavelength and it penetrates more deeply and it does more damage. UVA is present in much higher concentrations in sunlight. When you go outside today, 95% of the UV load that you're getting, perhaps even more than 95%, is UVA. It penetrates very deeply and, oh, does it do a number? It, it can create free radicals that can damage DNA, it can damage DNA directly. It, ruins collagen and elastin. So for those of you who have spent too much time out on the Santa Fe sun and you're feeling a bit wrinkly, you can blame UVA. UVA also breaks down folate. I indicated a moment ago that that was one of the negative aspects of ultraviolet radiation. Folate turns out to be monumentally important in the study of, in the story of evolution of skin color because folate is a B vitamin essential for the production of DNA. Without folate, uh, which we get from green vegetables, whole grains, citrus fruits, and several other sources, without this important vitamin, we cannot produce DNA. The fact that this particular type of UV can break down folate is highly evolutionarily significant. UV adversely affects human and other organisms' reproduction 
by breaking down folate. And this is really what, what our research has added to what was already a very long-term study of the evolution of human skin color conducted by many anthropologists over decades. What we have added is really a new piece about vitamins and specifically about the role of folate. Because folate is needed for the production of DNA and DNA is needed for the production of new cells, all types of new cells, any process that interrupts folate or that causes folate stores in the body to be depleted is a serious evolutionary problem because folate depletion will slow cell division. Cell division is something that all of you are doing right now. The cells in your gut, the cells in the lining of your mouth, your blood cells, all of them are undergoing division right now at a slow level, fueled by folate, probably your breakfast and your lunch. All the, all the things that you ate are helping to produce those processes. When else are when else during life does prodigious levels of cell division occur? During pregnancy and early development. It is at this time when we see enormous rises in the rates of cell division. In women, this is a prodigious increase in a very, very short period of time. What happens if you don't have enough folate? And in fact, in the last 20 years, one of the, the most important findings, I think, related to sort of vitamin physiology has been the recognition that folate is essential for normal reproductive success because of its role in fueling DNA production and cell division. And when, this is, this is you, okay? At three weeks of age, in your mother's uterus, this is what you looked like, okay? This tiny little worm of a thing, about a centimeter long, uh, absolutely undergoing the most dramatic levels of cell division. Very precisely timed. What you're seeing here in this, in this picture is the sequence, the three to four day sequence during which the primordia of your nervous system were being formed in very precisely timed episodes of cell division. If there isn't DNA, if there isn't folate in abundance, then this process goes awry. It can go awry in a little way, it can go awry in a big way, but it's extremely important that folate stores not be interrupted at this critical time. If there are, if they, if they are interrupted, a, a birth defect of varying severity can ensue. And this is why, beginning around 15 years ago, there was a tremendous uh, amount of publicity about folate supplements. And now, pregnant women and women who are thinking about getting pregnant are urged to take folate supplements and eat folate-rich uh, foods and, and eat folate-enriched cereals and bread and so forth. And folate has become the word on every obstetrician's tongue. It's a very, very important molecule because folate fuels cell division normally in all of us, but particularly in developing embryos. So now we can circle back and say, my goodness, in order for us to protect those molecules essential for reproduction, we need to have a built-in sunscreen. And really, dark pigmentation in all phases of human history has evolved for this purpose, as a natural sunscreen to slow the breakdown of folate by UVR, sorry, not URV, UVR, and also it protects the DNA in skin and it protects sweat glands. So melanin serves several important roles, probably the most important of which is protection of folate stores. Now, as I said, humans didn't just stick around the equator. The fact that we're talking here in Santa Fe means that at some point in our history, people moved out of equatorial Africa. And we know from research funded by the Leakey Foundation and others that humans, in fact, moved out of Africa in a few major exoduses, one of them about two million years ago, and another beginning around 130,000 years ago. Homo sapiens 
was this last exodus. Under these conditions, when humans are moving out of tropical latitudes, what happens when you have a very, very well-adapted, darkly pigmented human all of a sudden going into new environments where UV regimes are much different? This natural sunscreen, which worked to great advantage to protect people against the, the dissolution or the, the breakdown of folate and, and damage to other molecules, this heavy level of pigmentation now actually works against the body because it is such an effective sunscreen that it slows down the production of vitamin D in the skin. When we look at, uh, at NASA satellite data, and I thank here my husband and co-author, George Chaplin, for producing the maps that you'll see this evening, uh, we were able to get lots of excellent data from NASA on levels of ultraviolet radiation at the, at the Earth's surface. And George translated 191 million data points into uh, a series of maps that allow us to summarize the levels of ultraviolet radiation at the Earth's surface. This is an annual average map that shows the intensity of UV. There's the equator, and you can see the continental outlines here in thin black lines. There's South America, there's North America, Africa, Eurasia, Southeast Asia, and Australasia. What you can see, as you would predict, is that the highest levels of UV are around the equator, but we see particularly high levels in dry areas here, in equatorial Africa, but in, in the Sahara Desert today, also very high levels over uh, the Atacama Desert and other dry parts of, of Peru and Chile, very high levels over the Tibetan Plateau and in certain parts of Southeast Asia. And look, as soon as you get out of the tropics, which is about 22 and 0.3 or so degrees north and south latitude, you get into significantly lower levels of ultraviolet radiation. So all of a sudden, the selective regimes, the natural selection regimes, change dramatically. Another thing I want you to notice here is that look at how much of the northern hemisphere is in these low UV zones. Much of northern North America and a large fraction of Eurasia is in this very, very low UV area. This has profound implications for the evolution of lightly pigmented skin, which I'll come back to in just a moment. So what happens, coming back to the vitamin D story, what happens if you don't get enough vitamin D? Some pictures like this may be familiar to you, and possibly if you're of a certain age, your mother or your grandmother told you, you better take cod liver oil to provide you with vitamin D so that you have strong bones, so that you don't get rickets. These poor young people here in uh, early 20th century Britain, here in uh, Nigeria, uh, 2003, these two sets of people, both afflicted by nutritional rickets caused by vitamin D deficiency, which prevents calcium in the diet from being properly ingested and properly used by the primordial framework of the bones. In other words, the bones cannot be properly calcified as a result of, of normal activity. And they become bowed by the body's weight. So the bones are soft and pliable. This poor uh, young person lives in an area where there's lots of sun, but he has been raised in a sunless environment. So he has very dark skin, a natural sunscreen built in. He doesn't get outside very much at all, and has consequently not been able to make vitamin D in his skin at all, and has developed this, this very serious case of nutritional rickets. What's interesting is that Vitamin D deficiencies not only affect the skeleton like this, they affect many, many other bodily systems in ways that we're just beginning to appreciate fully. 
in cases of severe nutritional rickets, even the female pelvis is, is very severely restricted. And so normal childbirth can almost be effectively precluded in cases of severe, uh, severe rickets and vitamin D deficiency. This is the sharp end of natural selection. This is abject failure of reproductive success in the most obvious way. And as I just mentioned, vitamin D deficiencies are not always obvious in the form of softening of the bones in young people or in adults. But they're now, uh, we're now seeing through a variety of epidemiological studies that vitamin D deficiencies are associated with very high prevalences of certain cancers, prostate, breast, colon, and uterine cancer, all have been associated with uh, chronic vitamin D deficiencies, certain chronic infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, metabolic syndrome, and even seasonal affective disorder. Because, you know, vitamin D not only acts on the skin, uh, sorry, not only acts on the bones, there are vitamin D receptors on virtually all the organs in the body, including the brain. So the the behavioral effects of vitamin D deficiency are now just beginning to be appreciated. If this hasn't sold you on taking cod liver oil or the equivalent, I don't know what will. So to come to the other side of the story, we understand or we understood from our discussion a few minutes ago the probable reason for the evolution of dark pigmentation in skin. Now we can understand why depigmentation occurred, why loss of pigmentation would have occurred under particular environmental conditions, because it was important to maintain the potential for producing vitamin D, especially in areas of the world where UVB, these short UV wavelengths, were very rare indeed. If you go to England, 54 degrees or 52 to 54 degrees latitude. The amount of UVB that you will get throughout the year is very, very small. You'll get it through the summer months only, and you have to try to build up as much vitamin D in your body as you can during that time. As I'll advance to you in a few minutes, colonization of those very high latitude environments occurred very recently in human history and depended not only on loss of skin pigmentation, but on cultural innovations that made habitation of these latitudes possible. So what we have in the, in the history of human evolution, modern human evolution, is depigmentation of skin in the ancestors of Northwestern Europeans and the independent loss of pigment in the ancestor of Eastern Asians and the independent loss of pigmentation in the indigenous peoples of southernmost Africa, who are very, very different in their levels of pigmentation relative to people from equatorial Africa. The so-called Khoisan peoples or San Bushmen have very moderate or light levels of skin pigmentation compared to equatorial Africans they too have undergone depigmentation through natural selection in order to maintain vitamin D production capabilities in their skin. One of the interesting facts that has emerged in the course of our work is that if you look at skin colors in all indigenous populations, females in all these populations will be lighter than males. Why is that? Some people say, oh, it must be sexual selection. It must be that males have chosen lightly pigmented females over the years. Well, what's interesting is that even in many populations where people, males and females, are not discernibly different to the eye, their, their skin color is only discernibly different to special instruments that measure skin color quantitatively. Even in those populations, there is a functional difference. And so our hypothesis is that 
the initial difference between males and females and lightly colored females in all populations was based on the fact that females, especially during their reproductive years, have to be very, very good at maximizing vitamin D production in their skin because they have extraordinary needs for calcium in order to fuel the production of a healthy embryo and fetus, and then during breastfeeding in order to make calcium-rich milk. So females in every population that we study have skin that's lighter than males, at least initially, we think, for a good physiological reason, because females are at the knife's edge of natural selection, even more so than males. And so when we look at the map of predicted skin color, and this is another one of George's excellent maps, in which skin color, we've taken the known skin color for indigenous populations and done a multiple regression to create a map of predicted skin color for the entire world. The regression including environmental variables, most notably ultraviolet radiation, to which skin color is most closely related. And what we find that's very interesting is that there are places in the world, uh, continents like Africa, that are extremely heterogeneous in their skin color. And we know this when we travel throughout Africa. There are many very darkly pigmented people in equatorial Africa and in the Horn of Africa, but many lightly pigmented people as we get in the northern and southern extremities of the continent. The other interesting thing that we see here is that we see the same gradient in the New World. This map is actually a predicted, not actual, skin color. When we look at Native Americans from both North and South America, we find that this gradient isn't as pronounced as is shown here. The darks aren't as dark and the lights aren't as light. Why is that? Humans have been in the Americas for a far shorter period of time. We know from studies of archaeology and genetics these days and even linguistics that humans have been in the New World probably for less than 20,000 years, although archaeologists quibble over the exact dates. And so we see the same range of physical factors here, high ultraviolet light levels, but people have not had as much of a chance to adapt to these different ultraviolet light levels. Also, when human ancestors made it over the Bering Land Bridge or took coastal route along the coast of North and South America to colonize uh, the hinterland of these continents, humans came with culture. They had a lot of stuff. And the stuff was very, very good at helping to buffer them against the exigencies of the environment, including high levels of ultraviolet radiation. So in a sense, what we have in the new world is the same gradient as we have in the old world, but it's less pronounced, partly because humans have been here for a shorter period of time, and partly because we're so clever at protecting ourselves against the environment, and we've got better and better at it as time has gone on. Now, one of the things that we see in, uh, in all of these populations, these sort of intermediate colored populations, is that people can gain and lose pigmentation throughout the year. Many of you may be dying to get outside to get a tan. You've been inside all winter. It's been a long, hard, cold winter here in Santa Fe. You want to get outside. And your skin has the ability to gain in melanin pigment temporarily. And this does confer a very, very slight amount of increased protection against the sun. But don't fool yourself. It doesn't give you very much. So if you think, oh, I'm going to get that healthy tan. It's going to protect me against the sun. No, it's only going to increase your ability fractionally and you will still have only about 15 to 20 percent. Even the best tanned person can only develop about 15 to 20 percent of the sun screening ability that a naturally darkly pigmented person can. So 
what's, what's interesting about vitamin D pigment production in the skin is it varies according to the amount of melanin, and we can actually calculate the rate for any person of any skin color in any place, and we can easily do this, and we work with teams of epidemiologists all the time on this problem to help them out in their, in their studies. But vitamin D production potential varies tremendously according to your native pigmentation and according to where you live. And so if we just revisit our map to remind us where we live, look at these huge areas, again, with very, very low UV levels. These were the crucibles in which lightly pigmented skin evolved. When people started moving into these areas, here, moving into Central Europe 50,000 years ago, into the eastern parts of, of Eurasia uh, 40 to 50,000 years ago, these people were entering very low UV regimes. And we see the evolution of depigmented skin not once, but twice independently in the ancestors of these populations. If your skin is extremely pale, the very, very lightest pigmentation of skin, you can make vitamin D just about on, in most parts of the world through most of the year. The problem with having very lightly pigmented skin, however, is that in very sunny places with, with the high UV loads, your skin will suffer egregious levels of other kinds of damage, as I've just adumbrated earlier in the lecture. The only area where you can't make enough vitamin D is in this very northerly region here. Now, a lot of people live in northwestern Europe today. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So, you can, with lightly pigmented skin, you can produce vitamin D in all of these areas. If you have darkly pigmented skin, the areas in which you can safely produce vitamin D from casual exposure to the sun are much more limited. These polygons represent the safe areas for people with very darkly pigmented skin, and they're quite small. You can see that as soon as a very darkly pigmented person, let's say from equatorial Africa or the Horn of Africa, ventures out of these areas. Here, still within the tropics, they start running into problems of not being able to produce enough vitamin D in their skin. And so this is really the genesis of the depigmentation story. We started out as darkly pigmented members of the genus Homo, and we evolved independently as uh, European and Asian ancestors anyway to, to evolve depigmented skin via two genetically different pathways. And this has just been discovered by some of my colleagues at Penn State in the last few years. We're still awaiting the genetic evidence to show us exactly what uh, changes occurred in the evolution of southern African peoples that allowed them to become so lightly pigmented. But this work also is ongoing. Now, this same principle, the evolution of lightly pigmented skin, was important in our ancient cousins. We had inferred in our early comparative work that the ancestors or the, the relatives, the distant cousins of modern Europeans, the Neanderthals, must have evolved lightly pigmented skin because of the places where they lived in the Circum-Mediterranean, but also in many parts of Central Europe and Western Asia that receive relatively low amounts of UV. So we, on the basis of just population history, reconstructed their skin as being depigmented. And then, just late last year, some very clever people were able to take Neanderthal DNA, which is preserved in some well, uh, uh, in certain specimens of Neanderthal bones. And they looked at the sequence of the pigmentation gene 
in the recovered DNA. And what did they find? The same types of mutations that create light skin and red hair in Europeans today. Not the same, not exactly the same, but they would have been functionally equivalent. And so thence, this, this reconstruction was well justified. And it's estimated that perhaps at least 10%, perhaps more, of Neanderthals actually had very pale skin and red hair. Now, at the other side of the coin, when we think about human population histories, humans have been on the move, like very, very major on the move in the last 50,000 years, and they've gone to areas of low UV, and then many populations have, have dispersed back into areas where there's a lot of high UV. The ancestors of southern Indian peoples, here's a young woman from the southern part of India, it's very darkly pigmented skin. Her ancestors from about 20,000 years ago lived in northern India, where UV levels were much lower than they are in southern India. Her ancestors were more lightly pigmented, but she and her infant are very darkly pigmented. Australian Aboriginal peoples and Melanesians are very, very darkly pigmented. Almost certainly, they reacquired dark pigmentation after a period of being relatively depigmented as their ancestors dispersed on the way to Australia, a process that probably took at least a few thousand, if not tens of thousands of years. So deeply pigmented skin evolved in early Homo sapiens and has been maintained very strongly in equatorial Africa, but it has also evolved, and we can make an excellent circumstantial case, for it having evolved at least twice more, perhaps even more, independently in the ancestors of Australasians and Southern Indians. So just to, just to give you a little teaser here, if we plot all of the fossil and archeological sites for the genus Homo from two million years ago to 50,000 years ago, what we get is a map like this with a whole bunch of different dots representing different species. Don't worry about that right now. What we see is that this map shows where those dots would have lay relative to the competence of darkly pigmented people to make vitamin D. And we won't go into the different colors, but suffice it to say that even under the most permissive solar regimes, there were a lot of people living outside of areas that, that would allow vitamin D production if you had dark skin. In other words, there was tremendous amounts of natural selection pressure on the ancestors of these peoples to be lightly pigmented. And further, there were a lot of people living way far north here that lived way in those gray UV zones that I mentioned earlier. How did they make a living? They made a living because they had very depigmented skin and they had the technology to harvest vitamin D rich foods. Almost all of the peoples that we find, in fact all of them, to down, down to the last person, that live in extremely high latitudes, above 55 degrees north latitude, eat vitamin D rich foods. They eat marine mammals, they eat oily fish, or they eat terrestrial mammals that themselves have high quantities of vitamin D in their organ meats. Things like reindeer, which have a lot of vitamin D in their organ meats because the, the reindeer themselves eat vitamin D rich lichen and they pass, they concentrate that vitamin D into their bodily organs, which are then consumed by humans. So basically, outside of these UV permissive areas, humans had to have not only light skin, but they had to have the technological wherewithal to harvest vitamin D-rich foods. A really fascinating story of biology and culture being codependent. Many people ask me, 
about the Inuit, the Eskimos of Alaska and Northwestern Canada. How is it that these people have quite darkly pigmented skin? Well, firstly, when we look at, at unexposed areas of, of Inuit bodies, if we look at the inner arm, for instance, the skin is only moderately pigmented, but still it's much darker than we would predict. Why is that? Well, what's interesting about, about Inuit peoples is that they live in very UV-rich environments. Not UVB rich, but they get a lot of UVA. Where does the UVA come from? Reflection from, from the surface of water, reflection from sun and ice. These peoples have evolved extraordinary compromises between skin culture, skin color, and diet. All Inuit peoples, the earliest Inuit and subsequent populations, have been dependent on vitamin D rich foods. Notably, in their early history, a lot of big marine mammals, these days on smaller marine mammals and oily fish. And these vitamin D rich foods allowed the people to have more darkly pigmented skin than we would predict for their latitude. Again, a fascinating push-pull kind of evolutionary compromise that has been struck as a result of the culture that these people maintain. If they no longer maintain this diet, what happens to them? They suffer from extraordinarily high levels of vitamin D deficiencies, which is one of the main public health concerns now in Inuit communities and in First Nation communities in Northern Canada. Many of us today live in areas very far removed from our ancestral homelands. Many of us, here is a typical European man, he is visiting his colleague in Africa. He is at a great disadvantage because his lightly pigmented skin serves him very poorly. He will suffer from egregious levels of skin damage if he's not protected by sunscreen or by clothing or hats. And what we can't see, we can see he's got some age spots and some sun damage and some wrinkles. What we can't see is the folate that may have been broken down in his blood vessels as a result of high levels of UV exposure. And we have no idea what knock-on effects that may have had on his physiology and those of his offspring. What happens when darkly pigmented peoples come to live in areas with low UV? What happens when people from the Indian subcontinent or from Africa take up homes in North America or Europe? They are very much out of their normal UV regimes and their darkly pigmented sunscreen rich skin prevents them from making vitamin D in their skin except during the very, very height of the summer for short periods of time. So these people run a chronic risk of vitamin D deficiencies. And this is something that we need to attend to with respect to public health concerns. We spend a lot of time, and doctors and dermatologists spend a lot of time telling lightly pigmented people to protect themselves from, from the egregious effects of too much sun, we now need to spend equal amounts of time uh, instructing and educating darkly pigmented people to compensate for the lack of sun by taking vitamin D supplements. That's probably the easiest thing to do. And what happens if this doesn't happen? Well, bone diseases like nutritional rickets are on the rise in many darkly pigmented populations and especially when people undertake very, very uh, recent, in terms of evolutionarily recent, types of clothing. When you have people adopting cultural modes of, of body protection that prevent their bodies from making any vitamin D, this is a serious physical, physiological, and medical problem. And leading to increased incidence of rickets in many darkly pigmented populations throughout the world, especially people, especially those who wear concealing clothing or have inside jobs or who live inside most of the year. 
But now we're beginning to appreciate that vitamin D deficiencies aren't just problems of darkly pigmented people living in northerly places, but they're a problem for most of us. Dermatologists have been so effective at telling us to slather sunscreen on and to maintain clothes on and hats wearing and so forth that many of us who have lightly pigmented skin aren't producing enough vitamin D in our skin through normal casual sun exposure. And so the easiest way to get around this is through taking vitamin D rich foods, taking vitamin supplements, or having short, and I mean short, bursts of unprotected sun exposure. Don't tell your dermatologist I said this, okay? because I don't want you standing out baking for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, 10 minutes. And try not to expose your, your facial skin or your hand skin, which gets a lot of abuse. Try to expose other parts of your body. One dermatologist said, please encourage people to expose their buttocks. <laughs> if that's what you would like, go ahead. But 10 minutes a week or so will be sufficient. You'll make plenty of vitamin D for all of your physiological needs, and you can store much of that throughout the year. But certainly in the wintertime, make sure that you take vitamin D-rich foods or have vitamin D-enriched milk or both. What's so ironic, and I'll, I'll close up very, very soon, is that now, of course, we live in a world where people want to change their skin color. If you've got lightly pigmented skin, you want to look dark because it's glamorous, it's healthy, it's sexy. If you've got darkly pigmented skin, you want to look lighter. In both cases, these, these chameleon-like changes are undertaken because people want to assume whatever the skin color is associated with affluence and privilege. Many lightly pigmented people associate a tan with vacations and luxury and freedom from labor. Many darkly pigmented people associate light skin with the same thing, freedom from toil in the sun. What is so sinister is that these people feel culturally very pressured to change their skin color. And especially darkly pigmented people in many parts of the world feel that in order for them to get a good education, to get a good job, that they need to have lighter skin. Women feel they have to have lighter skin to be, quote, attractive, unquote, to males. And there is preference in many populations throughout the world for lighter pigmented people. Colorism, with this, this favoritism for lightly pigment, pigmented spectrum of, of uh, the lightly pigmented end of the skin color spectrum is now a pervasive social and biological problem. And these darkly pigmented people, this is, not, this is something that started among African American populations in the United States, quickly migrated to South Africa. It's now been taken on very strongly in equatorial Africa so that darkly pigmented women who have this beautiful complement of natural sunscreen in their skin want to lighten their skin to be more attractive, to, to realize some kind of, of Western aesthetic ideal. And some people use legal and, uh, types of preparations, skin creams, that they can buy in drugstores and supermarkets. They're fairly pricey, but they do it. Women who can't afford these go to illegal markets and they buy creams that have a lot of steroids, sometimes that have mercury or arsenic, that will kill the melanin producing cells. And this poor young woman was one of the people to use such, such very, uh, very harmful, permanently harmful kinds of, of skin lightening agents on her skin. She once had beautifully, evenly pigmented skin, and now many of the melanin-producing cells in her skin have been permanently damaged. A very, very uh, terrible uh, uh, heritage uh, that, that is really being visited upon, or a terrible practice that is being widely spread throughout many areas, and not just equatorial Africa, India, 
many, many parts of, of Eastern Asia now, uh, depigmentation to make oneself more attractive for both males and females is becoming more widely, more widespread and socially pervasive. Lightly pigmented people want to get darker, so if you're not going to sit out in the sun or bake out on the plaza, you might get a tan out of a bottle, and this is something that many, many people now do. They go to one of these tanning parlors, they get a spray-on tan, or they use this stuff on the bottles that turns their skin temporarily darker. We want this look because we associate it with luxury and health and affluence and freedom from labor. So it's, it's really, really paradoxical that, that humans seem to be always seeking something that they can't quite have with respect to their appearance. So to summarize, human skin color is an adaptation for regulating UV penetration into the skin. It's a good evolutionary adaptation. It's an excellent example of an evolutionary compromise. Evolution is very, very good at coming up with with ingenious answers to difficult problems. Melanin pigmentation levels in skin are an excellent example of this. And UVR, ultraviolet light, has influenced human settlement patterns. Archaeologists haven't really thought about this before, but we now have to begin to think about this in, e in our equations about what influenced human settlements at various times in the distant past. And human skin colors have evolved, evolved repeatedly in human history, the same skin colors over and over and over again. The fact that skin color is not unique to any human group means that it's useless as a marker of unique genetic ancestry. We can't use skin color as a so-called racial marker because skin color, the same skin color, has evolved over and over and over again. So it's a great example of natural selection acting on the human lineage. It's a horrible example of anything that is unique to any particular population. And skin color, as I hasten to point out to people, is an excellent example of evolution acting on you. If you're a biology teacher, if you're a parent, and you're trying to teach your students or your kids about evolution. Right now, you probably tell them about fossils, you might tell them about the evolution of melanistic butterflies in certain environments. Well, now there is an example of evolution that you can talk to just looking at your own skin. The evolution of human skin color is a fascinating story, now quite well understood immediately relevant to us in terms of our social commerce, in terms of our biology, in terms of our health, in terms of understanding why we look the way we do. Let's bring this into our classrooms and into our homes. One of the things I work very hard to do, and my husband with me, is bring this material into biology textbooks, into school curricula, so that kids can learn that evolution happened to them and they can see it as a testament in their skin. So as a, as a parting set of remarks, appreciate as you look at people around you, as you go out tonight, as you look at this vast array of different skin colors and textures, appreciate that history, that unwritten history that isn't in the fossil record but is every bit a part of our, our legacy. Appreciate that our skin colors, especially, are a product of human evolution, something to be wondered at, something to be talked about, something not to be hidden, and something, I hope, that can increase our mutual understanding of one another to good social as well as biological benefit. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to answer questions, and I apologize for, for going on a bit too long. 
I think there'll be a mic coming around. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. My wife is um, darkly pigmented from Southeast yes. Asia, and she's only been here for a few years. Is it advised that she should wear um, uh, UV uh, sunscreen type stuff or in her adaptative process? Probably during the height of the summer, and well, I would guess from, from now through August, for her to wear sunscreen, especially in the middle of the day, would be important to help prevent damage to her skin. One of the things uh, you can do is just, or, or advise your wife to do, is you know, just go out for a short period. As I, as I said, you know, 10 minutes a week is really all you need. The fact that she has moderate levels of pigmentation in her skin that's okay. She'll still get a lot of UVB during the summer months uh, at Santa Fe latitudes. So for most of the year, she should actively use some kind of protection to protect her skin from damage. Because one of the things that we deal with is the fact that we live to be very old organisms compared to our ancestors. If you talk to an early member of the genus Homo uh, a million and a half years ago, you would have been hard pressed to find anyone in the population over 30 years old. There'd be a few over 35, but most of the people in this audience wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have been there, okay? So we as humans didn't necessarily evolve to be very, very long-lived organisms. So it, it pays us to do as much preventive medicine during our lives as possible. And that means, in your wife's case, probably covering up, wearing some sunscreen, especially in the late summer, uh, sorry, the late spring, summer, and early autumn months. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the first question that this woman has about, uh, do you see a correlation in eye color? Yes and no. Uh, in some populations, uh, there is, there is very, very conservative levels of eye color. In African populations, for instance, we see very, very dark eye color that matches very dark skin pigmentation. And dark eye color helps the eye for the same reason that dark melanin pigmentation in the skin helps the skin. The, uh, the dark brown in the iris protects the eye, the retina, from high levels of UV radiation. It, it absorbs high levels of, of, of UV that is entering the eye and thus mitigates the UV load on the retina, which is very, very helpful. Uh, but this is not to say that these two are, are genetically connected because we find a lot of populations, for instance, in Eastern Asia, we find people with light or moderately pigmented skin who also have uniformly dark eyes. So we can see that there probably were multiple different ways to get dark eye pigmentation and that it wasn't necessarily related uh, to skin pigmentation. And in the ancestors of Europeans, we see a tremendous variety of eye colors, probably driven by initially a few mutations that produced blue eye color, which is a very low level of melanin in the iris of the eye, and then various mixtures of blue-eyed and brown-eyed people subsequently to produce all the intermediates that we see today, hazel, green eyes, and so forth. We're just beginning to fully appreciate the evolution, the complexities of the evolution of eye color. And if you go to any of the medical search engines on the web, you'll see that this is a huge area of research right now. Your second question. Uh, the question about, are there organizations that are trying to fight this, this fad or this trend toward a skin bleaching and loss of pigment? There are, but they don't hold a candle to the big cosmetics companies. 
And the big cosmetics and pharmaceutical companies are being very, very good at, at doing their thing, which is selling their products. And now that they have global advertising forums, big billboards and uh, electronic advertising at their fingertips, it's very easy for them to propagate imagery that has tremendous social effects. So even though there are some great health organizations that are promoting the idea that live with your skin, whatever the color is, enjoy your skin. If you've got darkly pigmented skin, revel in it and understand it and, and don't be embarrassed about it. But these organizations don't have nearly the amount of money and, uh, and marketing potential as many big companies do. Yes. Very interesting. Is there a difference in, uh, in biologically between people who have sort of bluish black and reddish black skin? This is an area of very active, uh, active research for me with some of my colleagues. And what we're doing is we're looking at the physical distribution of the melanin granules and the melanin producing organelles or the melanin storage organelles in the skin to see if the physical orientation in these different people with sort of blue black and reddish black skin is slightly different because there are high levels of melanin but what may impart the interesting subtleties of pigmentation it could be a chemical difference in the different types of melanin but it could also be an arrangement of the melanin containing organelles and how that causes the visible light to be reflected off of the surface of the skin so that's a very good question. There was another, yes, right up here. Hmm? Is there such a thing as race? No. Um, the, that's the long and short of it. Uh, I mean, we, we as humans are very good at assessing diversity in appearance. And in the United States, as a result of our unique history of habitation, we have a history of human interactions that has led to certain people being called or, or given certain labels. And so in this country, we tend to refer to black populations, white population, Hispanic, and sometimes these are given the names of races. But what's interesting is that these are, these are very much American historically defined entities. If you go to Brazil, the races that are defined there are different. In India, different again. In South Africa, different again. These, there are no biological races because if you had the luxury to be able to walk from one end of Africa to another and through Eurasia, what you would see at least 500 years ago or so before people started really moving around in a big way is you would see a gradual climb, a gradual gradient in skin color, in hair color and texture, in facial features, head shapes, limb lengths, all of these things that have been used to define so-called biological races by scientists in the past turn out to be very, very evenly and clinally distributed as we go from one population to the next. Now, as a result of modern human history, a lot of these populations have become fragmented and displaced, and people are not in the, in the original configurations they once were. But in the original configuration of our species, we sort of integrated finally from one place to another. And these different kinds of features, skin color, hair texture, some of them almost certainly were the very products of natural selection acting to produce better adaptations to local environment. Some other features which people have used to distinguish races, facial features and the like, may have simply evolved by accident. They, it didn't matter what shape nose you had or what shape eyelid you had. And so under certain circumstances, especially when humans' populations were very small at various times in our, in our recent past, at the end of the last ice age, some, some features of our body simply evolved because 
of small population effect because our gene pool was drastically reduced and a huge amount of variation was eliminated. So what we see in humans is mostly an even gradient that has now been interrupted by historical factors and no real races. The races that we live with in this country have been very historically and culturally contingent entities. What I worry about very much as a biologist is that now in the biomedical fraternity, there's a great move to try to put races on a more scientific basis by saying certain people have, a, have various percentages of certain kinds of genes that predispose them to certain diseases. And therefore, we must target them in order to make sure that they live healthy lives. Well, sort of a nice idea, but a very pernicious premise. Because if these influences are allowed to succeed and race is put on sort of a pseudo-biological footing and we have to fill out a census form and check certain boxes and say, you know, we belong to this and that and the other, and there's some kind of biomedical reality attached to it or supposedly attached to it, then that would be a lamentable situation indeed. Yes? Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. hmm. Right. Um, in, in response to your first question, there are now um, very good textbooks uh, available produced by the U.S. government. Your tax dollars put to good use. Look up on Amazon a book called Skin Deep, edited by Susan Gertz, G-E-R-T-Z. Uh, it's a wonderful book that provides lessons. It costs like $8 or something. It provides great lessons for middle and high school students to learn just about this. And it includes lots of stuff about tanning and skin bleaching as well. So that's, I think, very, very useful. Some of our work also is in popular form. Scientific American has various articles and readers that are available. And, and a lot of kids can enjoy these because they're very intelligible. With respect to the second point, I think it's, it's very important as we, as we study uh, certain genetically related disease conditions that we not overgeneralize and that there are, certain, there are certain populations from certain distinct small places that do have certain genes that predispose them to certain disease conditions at very high frequency. But that doesn't mean that you can generalize that one small population to a whole group that looks about the same. And it's that generalization that is extremely worrying. So, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, this may be fixed uh, when we all have our genotypes done at birth and we all you know, have a little uh, implanted chip that has our DNA sequence in it and we can see exactly what genes that we carry that might predispose us to various disease conditions. Then we won't have to worry about checking a box that announces that we belong to a certain group. Until then, you know, I really urge biomedical researchers to be very circumspect about how they define these populations and that, that doctors prescribing sort of racially tailored drugs be equally circumspect about looking at the risk factors very individually and not overgeneralize.